All right, guys, we're going to begin. We're going to begin. Uh, before we begin, uh, is there any questions about the rat or the mouse or anything? Yeah. Yeah. It does matter. That's true. It's a lot of trial and error, so as soon as you start messing around with them, they'll, you'll see that it'll like, uh, wobble to or oscillate to the center either quickly or not so quickly. But as, as long as it's like more or less you know, in, the, in the center, it's good. No, both, both motors. Or both, both encoders. So you're getting a reading from both encoders, right? And from that, you can tell if you're going left and right. And that's how you get your error. So, oh, um, um, going off of that, for this project specifically, yeah, you could do that because all we're asking you is go a straight line, right? There's no walls. But uh, like if you're getting an error reading and you're, you know, um, you're trying to get away from a wall, you can't just change the speed of one wheel. You can change the speed of one wheel, but it's probably faster to change the other speed as well, right? To turn faster. One thing you can do is, let's say, you can take your speeds, right? You know the speed of both your, your motors. Um, if you're going fast and you want to turn right, then you can decrease the speed of one of the motors, and that'll turn you one way. Yeah, you could do it like you that. You can yeah. do that. There's multiple ways to implement it. Uh, quick announcements really fast. Um, encoders are in. So if your team's encoders were broken and you couldn't do assignment two or three, they're in now, so there's no excuse. Just get it from one of us. Um, the other quick uh, announcement, you guys already know that you guys now have a mentor for your mouse uh, schematic and PCB, right? So um, for all the assignments, um, your bill of materials, and your schematic, um, they're being reviewed by either Brandon, me, or uh, one of those three, Arvin, Brian, and uh, Kyle. Um, so whatever problems you have, they'll be commenting on a comments sheet in your team folder. Fix those ASAP, OK? Um, and pretty much, they'll give you one week layover um, for any mistakes that they find. If they don't fix it, they'll tell us, and we'll drop you guys. So um, talk to them and be their friends, because uh, yeah. they'll well, be the ones who's making your mouse going to work. Yeah. Uh, you don't necessarily have to resolve those issues in, like on the first try, but as long as you're communicating with us and t saying like, um, oh, I didn't know how to do this, and then they'll kind of walk you through that. But as long as you're keeping in contact with us, uh, that's what we're mainly looking for. You guys all know your mentor, right? Like we, okay, so it's on the uh, team roster sheet. Um, I don't know if I, you guys have a link to that, but um, on the left column is the name of the mentor. Um, and I can send it out tonight again as well. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, we're still your main points of contacts, but specifically for your mouse, uh, those comments are being written by one of those three or us, uh, depending on your mentor. Yeah. That means maybe one of your gear ratios is not 100 to 1 or the gear ratios are off. So you can like, fix that with code. Like it could be that. So uh, you can just fix that in the code. You just have to mess around with the. Uh, the Either that or you can ask power. us for a new motor. But I, I mean, if you want to like, re solder on all those, we do have more motors. So if you want to sw swap one out, but you can also fix it with code. Any other questions about rat assignments, mouse assignments? You guys should all have that inside your folder by now so that we can finish up reviewing. If not, then we'll get started on lecture. And you guys don't have to save it. Oh, do you want to meet up now or after? I mean, you guys know, though, right? Who doesn't know their mentor? All right, I can read out the team names then. Um, All right, yeah. Let's, let's do it. You guys want to do it now or after? Uh, let's do it now so that you guys, like five minutes, okay?
All right, if you know your mentor already, go uh, meet with them. Uh, yeah, hey guys. All right, so I posted one of the comment sheets already. I think you guys saw the message. Okay, okay. Just uh, let me know when you guys go through those fixes. And then, okay, tell me when you upload those. Otherwise, I just have no clue. I'm gonna post it on the Facebook group again if you guys don't know your team folder, so you guys can find it there. Yeah. 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 So it actually does work. Um, so if you, I just wanted to make sure you guys checked on the data sheet because there's like, there's a voltage rating and then there's like a voltage low and then there's like a max value for that and then voltage high and then. They, they, yeah, so you guys need to make sure you guys do that. Otherwise, it could end up being. Otherwise, you'd have to use like like a level shifter and like up the uh, the voltage, which is you can do that, but there's no need to because it's 3.3. I think the minimum is actually 2.3, so it just so happens that it works. All right, I just copy pasted inside the uh, checkoff Excel sheet, so you can find there. Yeah, so you're, you're the one with the polo loo ones, right, still? So, okay. Yeah. You guys are, yeah. are my team. Well, and so for now, you guys, you guys can okay. keep it on that. Uh, get your schematic right? up so I can review it. Eventually, you'll have ASAP. to transfer it over. Um, what happens I, I mean, is, I haven't looked at it, so um, you, have to make um, you already did, so I want to review it today. So, um, you have to I'll try to review it tonight. Because um, if you think about it, right, it needs to read and So how readings. I'm going to do this your wheels, is your board's for worksheets, I'm just going to tell you the answer. Flat, um, but uh, if you get it wrong, if you get it wrong, and if it's blank, I'm going to call you on it, right? Or, or, so do, yeah, still do your worksheets, but so I think it's not. Measure it's for you to know what you're doing. right here, uh, right? So your code will for end up sitting right schematic, here. that's the main one I want you guys to keep always updated. I want you guys to have version numbers as you upload new ones, right? Eventually, Build materials, as you're adding more parts, Draw a line underneath the, the last times you put parts in, um, so that like every single week yeah, you have you, a new set of parts. Um, right? um, and I'll I tell you which parts you're missing. Uh, you just put it already or something like that. For motors, uh, keep um, your so bomb and, and schematic are the two things I care most about. Those little right? um, worksheets is for you to understand. Pins already in. So um, I don't know if you, I didn't look at your guys' logs, but have you guys been maintaining that? So whatever you choose. Okay, is that's just for me to know if you're dying, which I think both of you guys are, or three, all three of you guys are. Isn't it's an IC? So let me know if you guys have any midterms. Right. Deadlines up. I'm so here to there's help two you boards. Guys, there's so. the, or there's three. There's, yeah. There's a PCB for the, the mouse, right? The, that's pretty Friday, much your chassis. Yeah, six. And then there's, uh, okay, these six to sort of you guys breakout leave. boards for the encoders that kind of stick Hopefully out vertically like from the uh, six a.m. the Saturday, the, the chassis. So have you seen right, like you guys are my team or like my mouse? So mouse I already here. talked to you guys about your schematic. Uh, the things I care most about are schematic yeah, and build uh, materials. So on the sides, that's what you're going to be using wheels. to order your There's parts. There's also, also a green for your mouse, right? And I think you guys put a lot of thought inside which parts right you pick, which is really nice. So there are some things that okay. I think you guys are um, well, yeah, next time overcomplicating, but that's okay because kind of I like so seeing interesting idea, design over you know the same answer over and over again. Basically, it'll fit over the motor. So how it's going to work is I have a comment sheet for worksheet answers that I think could be refined. I'll just let you know like what I think about it. You don't have to update your answer or anything. Um, and I'll label that FYI yeah. for your information. And then right? anything else? Schematics, I'll be updating. I'll, I'll let you know like okay. if I see something wrong um, okay. about it. And I want you guys um, to update that uh, as fast as possible. Um, and um, there's a date uh, next to it. Uh, if you look at the, I don't think I created a comment sheet for you yet. Did I? So your team okay. folder? Yeah, I did. Oh, no, I didn't. Uh, go to comments. Uh, oh, your team folder. Encoders, did, you use that, did you use all the recommended parts last year? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't make those. So those were just handed down, but if you want to use those, those yeah, are so there's good. A, those will work. There's um, the comments 
that's basically so the premise of this here, here so that right, you guys can experience design the PCB in the comments, and designing. Um, I'll put whatever uh, you need to do. Schematic. So and then, not necessarily, well, you guys can do a little bit of design, but honestly, everything else is so much work that it kind of, you can get Encoder in a separate. Yeah. So basically create a folder called schematic, and every single time you um, update so the schematic, the recommended um, parts, it's not necessarily with a date, bad, like, but we, schematic, we try to like, this date, schematic, this date, or version one, version two, so I can see how you guys are updating. I haven't checked out your, your, the routing on your, your, on your uh, ICs yet, so I'll check that so, tonight and see if you have anything um, wrong. If I do, I'll put it there. As for your bill of materials, uh, yeah, I think you're pretty good with this, be, but um, literally put everything. JST connectors, I think you have part. switches. Um, okay. Yeah, let me yeah, know. And make sure you find, find the cheapest that. one. Um, because, yeah. Because I only made this one. Uh, I made it once, and I, that was a long time ago. So. Cheap, but yeah. like, it's not like. How about you guys? Did you guys you get a chance to go over it? Okay. That's not a problem. Sell something that we can provide like two two M with like Wait, well you the team you, your team has seven hundred no. million hour batteries, right? Even though you jumped? Yeah, that's good enough. Uh, I remember one of my so? teams had a hundred milliamps, that's not enough. You jumped oh, the wires? Yeah. <laughs> so actually I, I, I well, like, it had like forty C Okay. Yeah, oh, but you the, don't need forty C, okay. right? Yeah, just so both of them. I, that's good that you guys are finding the cheap right batteries. Now, that thing you that has a JST connector, though, right? But the motors yeah. in the okay, cool. still work. Um, motors still. So work. I haven't. I, I just barely like it's a schematic, and the, the thing that okay. most was wrong was the yeah, yeah, op amp. Sure everything else looks ground. pretty GX clean. And um, also, your traces that you label. Yeah, um, label absolutely. them so that I can understand. Because I remember there's like okay. nuclear 5 volt, right? Did you, you guys already? don't have a nuclear 5 volt eat? line anymore. So oh. name it things that make sense. Um, so, I think it's just. Five volt is like a switch. Okay. Oh, yeah. switch five volt. oh, just name it 5 volt, yeah. okay. right? Because like, just name it things that like, if I just look at the trace, okay. I know where it's going. Well, um, the thing is. Like, who taught you splitters, by the way? the bus. You guys take the bus. For now, it's taking the bus. Okay. So. Don't blindly copy. Like, if you don't, if you see something you don't understand, ask me They're about like, it. I don't know. We're gonna have like two. No one in, I don't know anyone else like, that shit. Like one point something. She's not going on the bus. Yeah. Charlie like is not going on the bus. I bet. Or just um, take it. See. Whatever, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll let you know now. The reason why you have separate uh, grounds is, is because going. the motor is very noisy. If you share that ground with something like an analog. I see like uh, a gyroscope, that noise affects the output. Right? Out. That's why you have separate grounds that all converge towards the battery at one point, as opposed to like uh, sharing the grounds all, all over the place. But yeah, that's why you use splitters. So to talk if to you see something on the RASC, I would you prefer if you guys like, consciously think about why you're doing something. Do you know who, if you don't understand it, ask who? me about it. Should Rather than, you know, yeah, it's right, your um, schematic looks really good, but look. you don't understand why you're doing that. Um, like there's many parts ego like we don't have so we just made one up like drawing the box and things. You have Arvin. But a, when it comes you have to Arvin. PCB board, uh -huh. we got Arvin. like some the ninja. Like language. He's wearing, wearing the gray shirt. Just see this thing. You're not gonna create so you have custom parts, right? Parts that aren't in the library. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have a workshop on yeah, how to create this, custom parts. Yeah. For now just that's have right. that box and know what the box that's does. Right. Um but when yeah, you yeah. do that you don't have to create a footprint and uh Hey. Wait, did you guys figure out your mentor and everything? Yeah. Okay. Brian. Brian? Okay. Oh, you can't see it. Okay. So. Good. Good. <laughs> All right. Well, where's my... Okay, so anyways, um, if you can find a part with the same footprint, yeah. that's the same thing. Well, that works. I'm not sure it has the same right. There, I think if it's the same, two, 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 uh, if it's the same packages, footprint, it's the same SMD, width and length. If it's not the so same footprint, then it's probably not. When you put that on footprint your, defines what uh, it looks like on the physical. Bomb. So make that's sure fine. You just make, um, make sure so I'll look at it a little uh, bit more carefully SMD. when I get back, so. um, probably today or tomorrow. I'll finish up all my comments, but it looks like you guys have a pretty Wait, good schematic. Uh, it's just Thomas, um, do, do I make sure team? you know what you're doing and not just copying over. And yeah, Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, uh, what and then you Greg have a good bomb, yeah, so there's not much to say there. So three things to fix. Yeah. Relabel your traces to so something How's that I can read going? and that you can you guys understand right away rather than just copping over. Sort of remove your op amp okay. and then uh, move your encoder to a separate schematic. All right. Well, other than that, let's go. Get, okay. Min, min. Yeah, okay, let's go. Wait, can we do this after? Because we have to get on with the lecture. 
but what we'll, I'll, I'll talk to you right after, okay? Oh, okay. Yep, we're gonna start back out. Are you my team? No, you're not. Okay. Okay. <sighs> okay. Guys, um, we're going to start lecture again. Um, so um, now that you guys all know your mentors, um, use them, message them, bother them. Just kidding, yeah. don't do this. But, um, okay. All right, so all right. this week we're gonna pretty much wrap up the last of the sensors, uh, encoders and, or, I'm not encoders, uh, infrared sensors and gyroscopes, right? So this is gonna be the last of your hardware besides the MCU um, next week. And uh, this, this part's fun because we're actually gonna start setting up the maze so you guys can actually put it in the maze and hopefully use that to calibrate. So get excited, guys. And so that PID framework you set up and wondered why you need the other two, um, this will be very apparent um, yeah. once you have walls. All right. All right, so yeah, infrared and gyroscopes. So. <laughs> okay. All right, so the infrared sensors. Do you guys roughly know what an infrared sensor involves? Do you guys know what infrared light is? Yeah, I, I assume you guys do. Okay, so there's an emitter, receiver, right? Emitter uh, fires an infrared uh, beam and then it reflects off an object and then comes back and you read the, the value, right? So that's the basic idea. Um, oh, yeah. here's a question. Why, why infrared? Why not, let's say, like blue light or something? Why do we, why do we, pick, uh, why do we pick infrared? There you go. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, less noise, less less variables on the environment. Right. So the purpose of infrared sensors is wall detection, right? This is the only way that you can tell there's an obstacle in front of you, whether it's because you need to turn or bounce you between the two walls uh, when you're traveling through a cell, right? Like we said, it consists of two parts, an emitter and a receiver. One emits the infrared beam, the other one receives, right? Um, and this is the first circuit that is not an IC, meaning it's not some magic black box where you just read a value in and out, right? We're actually gonna give you a circuit and you're gonna actually find out the values of all the passives in the circuit for this, right? So um, let's, let's think about what we need inside this infrared circuit, right? Um, first of all, you need to control your infrared sensor, right? So you're gonna need a transistor of some sort, right? Something where you can control the logic of whether you're firing the beam or not. Um, you're going to need a resistor, right? Because this is just like an LED. Um, you can't just run the full 3.3 or 5 volt line through this um, IR LED. Um, and then you're going to need capacitors to clean up some noise. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little about transistors, right? So does everyone know what a transistor is? Okay. You want to talk All about right. it? All right. So. Transistors are basically, you can think of them like switches. Uh, they're three ports, so um, there's the emitter, collector, and base, and uh, you apply voltage to your base, and it either allows current to flow from your emitter to your collector, or from your collector to your emitter, or it does not, based on the voltage that you apply. Very simply put. Uh, there's obviously more to that, but we'll not get into that for now. Quick question. Why do we need a transistor if you know the MCU can output a digital line of 3.3 volts or not power it, right? So why can't we just connect like an emitter directly to uh, to power the uh, IR LED? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, right. You don't want to provide, or you don't want to draw any current from the MCU, right? MCU's rating is a lot lower than that of like a battery. I think it's something like 20 milliamps. So, um, and you'll find out that um, from the IR LEDs, if you want really good uh, or really uh, powerful beams, you'll be drawing like I think 100 milliamps um, for like a very small second. So, why do we want powerful beams? <laughs> yeah. VAC. What? VAC. Clear signal. Clear. Um, Signal? Yeah, longer yeah, range. Longer exactly. range. Um, but yeah, so the idea is that transistors isolate logic from power, right? You're just providing logic through these transistors 
um, to either turn yes or no and allow um, a higher voltage or higher current to go through. Um, do you have a question? Well, you don't want to draw that much current from a pin on your MCU. Your MCU just wants to output the logic or is taking in a reading from, uh, from let's say, an analog device. But you don't want to ever use it to power anything. Um, Yeah, they'll actually go through the five volt regulator so that you know that you're you're going to be getting about the cons uh, same uh, uh, output voltage every time or output uh, IR light every time. So more current can go through the voltage regulator than the MCU, right? Um, so transistors come in two flavors. Uh, there are BJTs and MOSFETs. Um, for just sake of like simplicity, um, BJTs um, have a uh, draw current. Um, at the, I think it was, uh, not at the, the base. Base, right? Yeah. And then MOSFETs are voltage driven, um, and you apply a voltage at the gate. Gate, right? Which is pretty much the same thing as the base. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll just go to the next slide. Yeah. There is. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Yeah, we're actually going to talk about that, right? So BJT stands for uh, bipolar junction transistors. Um, like, like he said, there's three uh, terminals. There's a collector, emitter, and base. I think these are the ones we gave you for the, um, uh, for the rats, right? So um, that's what the symbol looks like, and that's what um, it physically looks like. Um, so these guys um, are current controlled, right? So uh, depending on whether it's uh, NPN or PNP, um, when you apply a current at the base, um, you will either turn the switch on or off and allow uh, current to go out uh, of the emitter. Yeah. Um, so we'll get into the circuit, what the circuit will actually look like. But basically what's happening is you need to compare your base voltage to your collect. Oh, OK. So basically, this is an NPN stands for uh, an N-type semiconductor on top of a P-type P semiconductor on top of an N-type. So uh, if you guys have taken your semiconductor classes, then you can kind of refer back to those. But um, yeah, basically, you're taking in a, a base uh, current right there. And that's either switching your, your uh, current on from your collector to emitter or not. The difference between an uh, NPN and a PNP is that um, that's literally what they are. It's a P, a, an MPN is P sandwiched between two N types, and um, a PNP is N sandwiched between two P types. Um, so the result of this is that it actually flips um, the the switch. So if for an NPN, if you switch the current high on the base, then it, it will allow current to flow. But a PNP, if you switch it high, then it will not. You have to switch it low. Um, and the way you're switching this is through your MCU. Does that kind of make sense to you guys? Um, you asked the question of how do we apply current to the base, right? Um, it's not really current driven. It's actually still uh, voltage. So you apply a voltage to the base. Um, when we say it's current driven, it means that the output of this transistor, so like um, whether we allow current to go through, is going to have some, uh, some scalar multiple of the current that you're applying at the base which means that you're drawing current uh, from the base out to mm -hmm. the emitter. Um, that's what we mean when we say current driven. Uh, it means that it's actively pulling current as well. Not much current. Very, very small amounts of current, like microamps. I think that's, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, you have a question? equal volts to the emitter. You Okay, so actually we're going to talk about that. Um, it makes more sense with the um, with the uh, MOSFETs. The, ans um. the quick answer is enough. <laughs> there's a you can refer to the data sheet, but there's uh, there's a um, there's a voltage between BE that you have to apply um, for it to be considered on. 
yeah. um, and that, that'll get you into. We'll uh, talk about this right, right uh, in the MOSFET actually, because um, MOSFET are are literally voltage driven, which means that they don't draw any current um, from the gate itself. Um, it's in the next slide. Um, so this is what uh, the MOSFETs look like, and they're voltage driven, right? Um, the idea is that uh, you don't draw any current from the gate, um, but how this works is a little bit more complicated in terms of um, how to trigger uh, the uh, the MOSFETs to be on or off, right? Um, so like, like you mentioned, there is a certain difference that you need to maintain in order to have this switch to be on and off depending on whether it's a PMOS or NMOS, right? Um, and so how it works is that there's a, a voltage difference between the gate um, and the source, right? So G minus S, um, and that has to uh, exceed or be under um, a certain voltage threshold, right? And that voltage threshold is gonna be inside your data sheet, right? Um, and like we said, it comes in two flavors, um, NMOS and, uh, or N, yeah, N, NMOS and uh, PMOS, right? So um, whether, um, whether you're applying a high voltage or low voltage at the gate is gonna be depending on your flavor, right? Um, so yeah, that's all we have to say about MOSFETs. What do you guys think we should use for your, for your mouse? Why? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't draw current from the gate, right? And that's the entire point of why we're using transistors. Um, yeah. All right, so VJT versus MOSFET. Uh, as we said, uh, MOSFETs are voltage controlled and VJTs are current controlled. Uh, VJTs can turn on at low, lower voltages, so it takes less to turn them on. Uh, so that V thresh we were talking about, it's a little bit easier to meet uh, with VJTs. Um, and then, let's see, so BJTs are actually faster than MOSFETs, but for our purposes, it's like not like substantial, so um, don't worry about that. There's also uh, less of a voltage drop across a MOSFET than a BJT, um, so keep that in mind. Um, Some common design considerations when you're picking your transistors, um, like any other part, there's certain conditions in which a part breaks down. Um, be sure to consider them, including, oh, what's the maximum voltage this VHAT or MOSFET can hold before it just breaks down and turns into um, a connection? Uh, what's the maximum current that you can pull from this VJT or MOSFET? And then the thermal dissipation as you're holding back uh, voltage, right? Um, other than that, that's the idea of a transistor. Are there any questions about that? Yeah. I mean, what's the reason why you don't want to draw current from the MCU in the first place, right? Oh, it's because uh, the MCU can only draw, uh, provide a, a limited amount of current. Yeah. And if you're using some of that to you know, draw away from using your transistors, um, that defeats the purpose of um, using a transistor in the first place, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller amount of current, but it's still drawing current from the MCU. And, yeah. yeah. A short burst. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So we'll get this into this a little bit later, but um, we'll we're gonna turn on and off our LEDs really quickly. Uh, you'll see that there's a curve where you can only provide so much current through a diode before it just burns out. So we're gonna be pushing the limits on that based off of turning this MOSFET on and off quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Did I answer your question. Okay. All right, so this is the circuit, the full circuit, right? Oh, nice. Um, the NMOS, like we said, is going to be the V gate, subtract V source. It has to be greater than V thresh, right? For PMOS, it's the exact opposite. V source, subtract V gate, has to be greater than V thresh. Um, I guess this kind of summarizes um, uh, this. But So if you notice in the NMOS, your LED and your resistor is above um, yes. at the source. Why? So you're actually comparing voltages between your gate and your, uh, your drain. So if it's below, then you might not see a voltage drop, and then it'll always be either on or always off, and you wouldn't be able to switch back and forth if you put it below, because then there's a load, right? And then the top one would, the, the, the drain, 
Uh, which one's on the top? It's the. I think it's the source. Or the source. The, yeah. So the source would always be at VDD, and then your MCU would either be high or low. But then it's comparing the gate and the the drain. Uh, just to simplify it, so y w the voltage at the very top is VDD, right? The voltage at the very bottom is ground, right? So it's zero, right? What's the voltage right before the uh, source? Right. It's unknown, right? Depending on your load, right? So you don't, you can't make any guarantees about that voltage, um, but because you're doing an NMOS, you know that's zero, and you know the gate MCU is 3.3, .3, so you know the exact difference, and you know whether it meets the V-thresh or not. But if you were to put the components on the bottom, um, you don't know the voltage right outside the, the drain, which means that that voltage is unknown. So you don't know whether the difference between V-gate and the, that voltage at that point is going to meet your threshold or not, depending on your load, right? So, so what we're asking is, what happens if we switch the order? If we went from VDD to the M, or to the NMOS to the R1 to LED, right? Uh, so the top would always be VDD, right? That seen, seen at the source, but we don't know what it's going to be at the bottom. You would assume that it's off because, or let's just assume that the the, um, the NMOS is off, then. Uh, then no matter what uh, voltage the MCU sees, if you apply a high voltage, then it'll be on, right? But if you apply a low voltage, then I guess it'll be off, right? So, um, is that? Okay, so um, say you want to turn it on, right? You want to turn it on, you apply the MCU voltage, right? And that voltage is, theoretically supposed to provide a big enough difference between this and the output um, such that it, it exceeds the V threshold, right? Yeah. But, like, say we had a circuit that looks similar to something on, on like, the right side, right? Um, except for PMOS, you have an NMOS, right? You don't know the voltage um, at the output because there's some drop before you go to zero, yeah, right? So if that load is something that you don't know, like, for example, it's an LED, you don't know the resistor of the LED for some reason, um, that voltage is going to be, like, Something greater than zero, right? Or even if the load was, if the load's big enough, then there's, there's, that means there's a higher voltage drop across the resistor and the LED. And let's say that voltage drop is big enough that you don't pass that V thrush anymore, right? Um, so, so like, for, uh, let's use real numbers, right? Yeah. VDD is 3.3, .3, right? Um, let's say the output um, is, is going to be, um, the output should be um, some amount, but then there's a drop down to zero, right? So that means it's going to be like something between 3.3 .3 and zero, right? But if that number, like say, say it's x, um, say, the, say your gate is, uh, your input for your gate is 3.3, 3.3 subtract x is not greater than v thresh, suddenly you're trying to turn it on, but it's not turning on because you don't know that voltage at the output. Yeah, well, let's draw it out really quickly. Yeah. That might help. So you have VDD right here, right? Let's say that's like 3.3. Oh, it's not a three. Uh, and then we put our NPN right here. And then we had our resistor, and then our diode, and then ground, right? So assuming that this is on, right? Our, um, so you're guaranteed that this, this voltage is 3.3 .3 always, right? But you don't know what this is. Right? Let's say that if, if we do allow current to flow, then the voltage right here, V out, would be some 3.3 .3 minus the voltage drop across this transistor. But now that, that drop right here, or V out compared to your base voltage right here, that is not high enough. That difference between the VB, your base voltage, and your V out is not high enough to turn this on, so it would turn it off. Right? So no matter what now, your, your whole setup is always going to be off. So this is why you don't put your, uh, your resistor, your load, uh, below the, um, the transistor or the MOSFET. If it's an N channel. If it's a P channel, yeah, it's so R P MOS. It's the exact opposite. So you're basically comparing your V thresh. Your V thresh has to be bigger than, let's say, some V B minus V out. 
right? And if this is 3.3, .3, there's a small voltage drop across here. Let's say it's like 0.1 volts. Then uh, let's say you apply 3.3 .3 to VB. So VB is equal to 3.3 .3 volts, right? There's a small voltage drop across here, let's say 0.1. Now this is 3.2 volts. So now it's comparing 3.3 .3 versus 3.2. That's not enough to turn on your transistor and no current will flow. Does that make sense now? I hope that made a little bit more sense with some numbers. Because you're guaranteed that the V out now is zero. Because this is ground right here. And there has to be a 3.3 .3 drop from here to ground, right? So that means that your drop, most of your voltage drop is occurring right here through your resistor and your, your diode, right? That means this is pretty high. This V out is pretty high. And that means that this V out, the, the emitter voltage and the base voltage are pretty much the same thing. And if those are pretty much the same thing, that's not enough to turn, it, turn on your transistor. But so the essence is that we're, with this transistor, we're comparing the base voltage to the emitter voltage. And if you put, if you put your load below the transistor, then you're not guaranteed that this will be high enough to turn on your transistor. So basically, always just put your load above it if it's NPN or NMOS. You guys and you'll learn about it in your classes. Yeah. Follow so far? Um, this is very crucial. So we see the order on your schematic wrong. We'll call you out on it, because this will pretty much cause hours of debugging, um, only to realize that you made a mistake like this. All right. Yeah, I made this mistake before. So. And I had to resolder this times four, because there's four LEDs. So you don't want to do that. OK. So that's transistors and how the circuit will look like for your emitters. OK? Um, actually, quick thing. How many, of you guys, uh, how many of these do you guys think we need? Yeah, so how many do you guys want on your mouse? Or do you think you need? This is a design question, right? Like, how many, what do you want to detect? Six. Six? Okay. Um, why? Okay. Um, the idea is you detect front and side, right? So, I mean, uh, six works. How many uh, do your rats have? Or, or what, yeah. you need one transistor for each LED, basically. Yeah. That's, yeah. So one of these circuits for each side that you want to detect. Six is an answer that's valid. I'll ask you why, though. All right, so quick things about the passives, right? Um, you guys already know voltage dividers, so I'm not going to re-explain yeah. this. But obviously, your um, LEDs have a maximum current that can go through it, right? Your, um, uh, resistor provides the voltage drop so that that voltage drop across your LED is not something where a lot of current's going through um, that LED. Um, and we'll actually talk about how much current you want through that LED. And depending on how much current you want is the resistor value you pick. Um, and then a uh, quick thing about um, transistors. Uh, are you guys aware of the pull up and pull down concept? Um, this is very important, pull up and pull down. So. Basically, the idea is that you provide a very high voltage or a very high resistor, so um, very little current flows. So um, uh, I guess we need an example. Um, we can do a pull-down resistor yeah. for this guy. All right. So Wait, actually, going off of the example without, uh, before the pull-down resistor, what happens if we uh, turn off the current? So, so we, to turn this on, um, um, assuming that the load is above um, so it's valid, if we apply a voltage to VB, it turns on, right? So now we want to turn it off. So we switch off. We tell the MCU, OK, stop applying a voltage at VB, right? What happens? It, theoretically, what would you want it to do? Right, you want it to turn off at that point, right? But what is VB at that point? Theoretically, it should drop to zero, right? But it's not necessarily drop. It's not necessarily going to go to zero because there's still, you know, electrons at that point. So a floating value at that point. You're not applying zero, right? You're just stopping. You're not applying voltage anymore, which means that that VB is undefined. 
So, it's here, so it might still be on, if all you know, but you can't control it, right? All right, really quickly, guys, is this, is this on or off? Is it, is it on or off? If the base voltage is zero, and this is also emitter voltage, voltage is also zero, it would be on or off? It will be off, right. So now what, let's say we hooked up the MCU right here. So V, let's just call it VB again. So, right, so now the MC is hooked up right here. It either applies 3.3 volts or zero volts, right? High is 3.3, low is zero. So what happens if we set this low? Will the transistor be on or off, or will the diode be on or off? Off. Now what if we, what happens when we make this 3.3? <laughs> what? Yeah, why is it dangerous? Exactly. We, we, sh we made a short circuit from 3.3 in ground from the MCU. So that's pretty much like pulling max current from your MCU. So that's bad. So instead of doing this, right, let's, let's put a resistor right here, right? And let's make it really large. Let's like make it like, I don't know, 47K. Okay. So now, now when this is low, right, this is also low, right? There's no, if, if VB is zero, then this is zero and the whole thing's off, right? Now let's make this 3.3, uh, what happens? The voltage drop is going to be here. And how much current is going to flow? Not very much, right? So the entire voltage drop is right here. Your transistor still sees pretty much 3. Point, well, it will see 3.3 volts, right? And this will be on. on. Your, your diode will be on. Yes? Yeah, it should be a MOSFET. This, yeah. So, whatever the symbol <laughs> is. You guys understand what happens if we That's didn't have that, that uh, resistor to ground, or we didn't even connect it to ground, right? Like, if we didn't have that uh, resistor and that ground symbol, and we tried to turn it off, that voltage is undefined. So, um, so when, we apply when we turn off the voltage, it might still be high. But because that voltage is high and you connect it to ground, you know, um, the voltage will balance out, right? So it goes now, uh, it'll go, it'll pulled it down to zero, yeah, essentially. So you get current this way. So is this a pull up or pull down resistor? It's a pull down. This, this resistor is pulling this gate down to zero. And then it's only changing when you apply some external voltage. What is that? Oh, yeah. it's a I rectangle. What? Here. So a MOSFET has a capacitor model internally. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, no, fine. So there is a capacitor right here. So what happens when this goes to your MCU? <coughs> and you say you turn off your MCU. There will be no current. So this acts as a high impedance output. It says it's off. So what happens when you have a capacitor charge right here? Is the current going to go anywhere? Right. Yeah, so the voltage will stay there. So that's where you need to pull down is to discharge the capacitor, especially on a MOSFET, since there is a voltage stored there. Same thing mm. with you pull it up and keep it at a high value. Yeah, don't yeah. feel bad if you don't really understand this. This is like an entire class, like both of these two, trans BJTs and MOSFETs. So if you don't get it, just know that you always have to pull them down, and it's a switch. <laughs> so that's that. Simple when, version of this. When do you use a pull down versus when do you use a pull up? What? Right, depends on the type of transistor you're using, right? PMOS or NMOS, right? PMOS is use pull up, and MOS is use pull down. So, yeah. All right. All right. Okay, so this is actually the infrared LEDs, um, and we'll talk about 
um, how much current you're going to be providing for the LEDs. All right, so what do we look for in infrared, I, uh, or infrared LEDs? We want high, high angle or low angle? Do you want angle of emission? Do you want widespread or just a very narrow beam? Yeah, yeah exactly, because we're going to be trying to sense the wall or one point on the wall. Right. So we want to know that one distance. We don't really care about the widespread. Right. Um, Wavelengths, um, you know that infrared is like a certain spectrum. You want this spectrum to be the same spec or the, the same output uh, frequency to be the same as what you can receive, right? So that's very important uh, when you're picking your uh, IR LEDs and IR emitters. Those two have to match or else you're not reading anything, essentially. Yeah. Um, the ones we uh, provided for you do match. So a lot of teams uh, tend to reuse that, but we definitely recommend you read through the data sheet and understand um, why. We picked those. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about how much current can go through these guys. Oh, that's a circuit. All right. Oh. Yeah. So if you notice, we didn't put a pull down resistor right there, which I should have. Yeah. Uh, this does not have a pull down resistor. <laughs> so don't copy this one exactly. Uh, but we have a resistor, a diode, and then two caps right there. Uh, what those two caps are doing is if you're switching this thing on and off really quickly, uh, what happens is you make a lot of noise because you're, you're driving something high and low really quickly. So those things, or, and also your LED will, will want a lot of, uh, of current immediately. And those two kind of act as a reservoir. So as soon as you turn that on, the vol um, uh, current will flow from the uh, capacitors to satisfy the the voltage drop across the resistor and the diode. Does that make sense? Um, we didn't really talk about caps and the passives, but um, remember, like for the regulators, caps were used to clean up noise um, because it provides, like, like we said, a reservoir um, to draw current right away. Um, or whenever it dips, it charges up. Whenever um, it, uh, or whenever it dips, it provides the extra voltage. Whenever it goes up, it charges up. So that's what the cap. What happens when you put two capacitors in series or in parallel? They add. Yeah, exactly. So we wanted that value, 4.8 microfarads. <laughs> and you can figure out that value by, um, if you remember in your circuits class, your RC constant, right? So that's how much time it takes for you to charge your caps or discharge your caps. So. That's a good oh, question. That's a good question. So what you'll probably be doing in your mouse is you'll be um, turning maybe one on at a time, right? So you turn your left one on, then another one on, or turn them on and off, turn the, another one on and off, turn the front one on and off, turn the right one on and off, and then you cycle through that as fast as you can so you can get as many readings as possible. So we all turn them on You turn them on, you take a reading, you turn them off. Why right? would you want to do that? What? Well, I mean, I'm asking him, why would you want to do that? Turn them all on at the same time? Yeah. Oh, why wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah. That's, a mean, one, that's one reason, yeah. Yeah, right. you're going to get reflections from random parts of the maze. Right. Um, you're so, going to only run into a certain number of issues where you, or scenarios where you, you, there's a wall in front of you and there's a wall to the left. You want, to, you want to handle those cases separately. So when we say we turn them on and off, there's two things that should come to mind, right? How long are we going to turn each one on for? And how, um, um, how long are we going to take a break? All right, how, how, long do we, how much do we cycle through each one, right? So that variable is dependent on this graph. OK, so if you guys remember, we talked about applying variable current or applying a certain current um, through the um, IR LEDs. And we're not turning them all at once, which means that they're not at 100% duty cycle. Um, are you guys aware of the idea of what a duty cycle is? Yeah? OK, so pretty much how long something is on for in a certain period, right? Um, based on your duty cycle, um, you can apply um, and how long each uh, 
how long um, the on time per cycle is, um, you can provide a different current through the IR LEDs, right? So, so yeah, yeah, quick question. Why would you apply a higher current through an LED? Right, it's more intense, right? It's, it's brighter. So how do we control how much current we're going to pass through it? That would, that would control how long it's on and off, but how do we actually control how much current's th flowing through it? Yeah, so you're, you pick a resistor value so that you can set it at one of these uh, values. So, so um, this is the graph straight from the data sheet for the emitters um, or the IR LEDs. Um, the idea is this is the time, the, duty, uh, the on time, um, and this is the, uh, how much current you can drive through it, right? Um, and then the D is stands for the, the duty cycle, right? So each graph represents um, the duty cycle per period, right? So for example, at 100% duty cycle, or one, you notice that you can't apply more than uh, 0.1, I think, uh, amps, right? You guys kind of see like that very bottom line, uh, almost parallel to the horizontal axis. You can't apply more than one, ac uh, one volt, um, no matter what the uh, 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 on time is, right? But like if you look at, for example, the point, uh, uh, let's see, point 0.5, for example, um, that line is slightly above, which means that you can apply a higher current through there. So you're going to be reading this graph and determining, OK, how long do I want these IR LEDs on for? And um, how, long are, how, how long each duty cycle is, right? How long does it take for me to cycle through all four LEDs? Once you determine those factors, um, you can figure out on this graph what's the maximum current that you can apply through these IR LEDs, right? And the more current that you, your goal is to apply more current because the more current you can provide, the farther you can see. Does that make sense? Um, well, I mean, th that depends on the duty cycle that you pick, right? Like, okay, but think about it, right? So your duty cycle is going to be between how many LEDs you have, right? Each one's going to be on for um, an even amount of time, hopefully, right? So that's four. Uh, one cycle is all four, so that's 0.25 duty cycle, right? So you look at the graph, the closest one is uh, 0.2, right? From that, um, you can look at, okay, how long do I, want, do I need each LED to be on, right? So how long does it take for me to fire an LED and get an accurate reading, right? You might want to read like three readings before you turn it off. So from that, you can figure out how long you want it to be on for. Um, once you figure that out, you can figure out what's the maximum current based on this graph. Once you have that maximum current, you just find the correct resistor value. Yeah. You'll, you'll figure that out. <laughs> yeah. This is actually going to be uh, trial, something that right? we want you guys to experiment with. Um, if you design your circuit properly, you can switch out the resistor values, right, and change your duty cycle up. Does this make sense, the idea of why you want more current and how you provide more current and how, how much current you can provide in a certain amount of time? This is really important. If we see you guys, like, pick a resistor value that's really large just so that you can have 100% duty cycle, we're going to call you out on that. Yeah, this, this is just telling you how long you can leave your LEDs on. There's another one to tell you also how, what resistor you can pick. It's a forward drop across the diode. OK. Phototransistors. These are the receivers. They're what reads the IR LEDs. Do you guys know the basic concept of a photo uh, transistor? My bad. Yeah, decrease yeah. or increase. Or, or yeah, it it lowers its impedance. So it's actually, it's a literally a phototransistor. So you're you're applying some current at the base. That's being applied because of light. So it's exciting some electrons and allowing current to flow. Yeah. So um, they're wavelength specific, meaning that they only function at a certain uh, wavelength, which is why we have to make sure they match with your uh, uh, emitter. Um, why do you have a resistor? No, let's say there's no resistor. What would you read at V out? Zero. Yeah, that's why you want it. Yeah. And it's a voltage divider, right? So you can read some voltage. What happens if you switch the order of your transistor and your resistor? What would you be reading instead?
Yeah, right. so you, your, whole th your whole range just flips. That's, that's the only thing. So instead of, let's say, if you applied light and you're reading a high value at V out, um, when you flip it and you apply light to the transistor, then you'd be reading a low voltage instead. So that's the only thing that happens. How do you pick your resistor? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just tell you it's around 10k for most of these. <laughs> but um, the idea, and if you guys really care, you can figure it out this experimentally. It's in the next slide. Um, your goal is to not have saturated readings, right? You don't want to be able to read maximum voltage, which is in which case the, the resistor is you know zero, or you know a so large of a resistance where you're reading zero or something like that, right? Um, you want something where you can get a wide variety of range depending on how, the intensity of light, right? Because this is supposed to signal, the V out signal, is supposed to tell you how far you, do, you are from a wall, right? So if you have saturation um, because your, your emitter is way too intense and your resistor value is too low so that your drop is too large or too small, um, it won't tell you anything about the distance, and that's a very inaccurate reading, right? So your, your goal is to find an RE such that the range in which you're reading um, based on the distance, right, from very close to like as far as away from the walls as possible, um, gives you a, a full spectrum of readings, right? That's, that's how you think, uh, that's how you find out the RE values, right? Yeah, and you'll also see that these readings that you get are very dependent on the position of your sensor. So if one is just tilted slightly too much, then you'll get a completely different reading. So one, I, one thing you guys want, might want to keep in mind is uh, hot gluing them in place so that they don't move. Probably for this? Yeah. Where would you put the capacitor? Yeah, so that's basically, if you think about it, right, it's an RC constant, right? So if you want to always apply, or what, right when you turn it on, you want uh, max current to flow. You want to make sure you have enough in your uh, reservoir, right? So you just have to calculate, do some calculations that way. It needs to be big enough where it can supply that voltage, but not small enough, or, but not too big. Otherwise, it's going to take forever to charge that capacitor up. So before we move on to gyroscopes, are there any questions about the IR LEDs? Um, this was a lot more in depth than I think most of you guys wanted it, but yeah. so I, just so you guys understand the thought process behind what, what goes, because this is what pretty much determines how, how your walls, or how your mouse can map out this maze. So the sensor is probably the mo most important right after like encoders. So that's why we put a lot of time into this. All right, gyroscope. All right. So a gyroscope, it measures the angular velocity. Um, that's, if you remember from physics, how much you're sweeping across, right? The speed at which you're moving or you're turning. Um, so it won't give you absolute uh, position. You can integrate it. Um, so there's several different types of gyroscopes. There's digital, and that just means that it's communicating with your MCU via uh, communication protocol like uh, SPI or I squared C. Um, these tend to have well, less noise because you're giving them digital values. It's either high or low. There's no going wrong there. Um, and that means they tend to be easier to implement. Um, you'll get to see that in uh, when you guys board your gyros. Um, analogs, um, analog just means it's outputting a certain voltage. Um, and you're reading that voltage. And that means so if you're turning, you'll get uh, a high voltage. Or if you're not turning, you'll get a low voltage. Um, this gives you the angular velocity. So how do you get from velocity to uh, position, angular position? He already said it. Yeah, the integral, integrate. right? Yeah. Um, the higher your sample rate of your, encoder, of, of your uh, gyroscope, the more accurate this Riemann sum will be. So one issue with gyroscopes is that if you do this integration for too long, what happens is you'll get um, these gyroscopes aren't perfect. And you'll get a little bit of drift. So no matter what, your, your, your readings are going to drift. So 
as soon as you just, you're just sitting there, right, you're going to see that it looks like you're turning. So you need to account for this drift somehow. And that's a coding challenge. Does it matter? Do you think it matters? It, uh, it doesn't matter. Because the whole body, it's a rigid body and it's turning all together, right? Are you saying like the farther it out is out from the, the where it's turning, it'll be I'll have different readings? Is that what you're saying? It's rotation, right? It's yeah. not this. It's it's still it, from its perspective, it's just rotating. Yeah. So you're going to get the same readings no matter where you put it on your board. And you can look that up if you really want to. Okay. Um, I think this is the last slide. Some design considerations. Um, range, right? Uh, you know, how much do you really need to t detect how much you turn, right? For a micro mouse, do you ever deal 180 turn? Well, they actually this do. range is saying how fast can you turn in a given time, right? So are, how fast do you think you, you're turning? Do you think you're doing like 500 RPM? No, you're not doing anywhere close <laughs> to that. So your range can be kind of small. Uh, sensitivity, um, this is kind of the opposite of, or how much variance you do per change in angular velocity. Um, if you are too sensitive, right, you'll saturate that reading value really fast, which means you can't detect a wide range of speed, but you're very sensitive and very accurate about how fast you're moving. Um, you know, range and sensitivity are very inversely related. Um, like Brandon mentioned, there is a bias with encoders, which means there's some drift that even if you're not moving, you'll get some angular velocity reading. Um, you need to account that with code. And the purpose of the gyro is just to collaborate with your encoders so that you can get a more accurate reading on where you are in the maze. Um, you'll see that um, you can also talk with your IR sensors to see if you're really in the middle of the, of the corridor or if you're not. Um, and you'll need to check every so often with your IRs just to um, reevaluate where you actually are. Is that it? Yeah, I think that's the last slide for um, IR LEDs and gyroscope. Some quick things about assignments. RAT assignment 4, I think. RAT assignment 4 is uh, LEDs. So this one is probably going to be the, the LEDs are going to be the easiest to uh, solder on. It's just a couple of, of transistors and resistors and your LEDs. Um, the gyro, on the other hand, is surface mount, um, and we'll be holding a workshop, I believe. Yeah, next Tuesday. Um, so next Tuesday. Or, or we, have we planned that? We haven't planned that. Yeah, but um, there's going to be a workshop for surface mount soldering. So, do so you guys are aware. Be sure of to come to that because that is. If you think that soldering is hard, you haven't tried surface mount soldering. So, and be prepared. Yeah, and it's going to be fun. As for mouse assignment, or as for mouse assignments. Difference between surface mount and normal soldering? You can, but uh, you'll see surface mount soldering is just very, you're dealing with very small components, right? And there's just, it's a different technique entirely. So, uh, You want surface mount because, well, when you guys design your boards, it's, they're going to be two layers. If you make them through a hole, it's going to be impossible. You're, you're going to make uh, pretty much a whole wall of, of through hole components where you can't put a trace through anymore. So surface mount will just lay on the top layer. That means you can put a trace underneath it and not affect the top layer. Through hole would make a hole in your whole PCB. Uh, mouse assignments. You're going to be picking your IR LEDs and your gyroscopes. Um, I mean, these components are usually just use of them from the rat, but at least uh, do the worksheet and consider all the factors that we talked about. Um, and for us, the upcoming things, um, next week is the MCU lecture, right? So this is going to be probably the most complex part of your mouse. This is what we talk about, controlling all the logic and all that. Right now, we're just using embed and we're writing some uh, C++ code that's very, you know, uh, there's a nice library and all that. But this black box is very powerful, and there's a lot of things inside this 
um, that you want to consider about um, and why we use a certain microcontroller. So be sure to go through that lecture um, and tell all your teammates to be there for that lecture. Yeah. Um, Arvin's going to be giving that lecture, and he's the god of embedded systems. Yeah. Um, yeah. He also is hosting a workshop series on microcontrollers next week as well. So if you guys want to get ahead, go to those. Yeah. And yeah, thank you everyone for showing up today. Uh, if you didn't know.